everybody. Today I am driving the glitter-covered, stripy rainbow sheep of the Range Rover family. This is the P38. This is a car that grew up wanting to be a star, but whose parents told it you'll never be anything more than a wastrel. Even today, and amongst enthusiasts, this is a car that divides opinion, with some believing it deserves its place in the dusty dark corner of the history books, and others who feel this is an underappreciated gem. Today, this uninformed and somewhat impartial idiot is going to see on which side of the fence he sits. love to say that I'm here to give the P38 a second chance, but I think the fact is, it never really had much of a first one. You see, this is a car which already had a very difficult task, following on from the immensely successful and long-lived first-generation Range Rover, today known as the Classic. However, when Rover's new owners, BMW, took over and they saw the state of the intended second-generation Range Rover, they were absolutely mortified, because here, in their opinion, was a car that simply wasn't fit for release. Unfortunately, Fortunately for them, they hadn't arrived anywhere near early enough to be able to influence the car significantly and were far too late to cancel it and start again. So this car was launched in 1994 but became the shortest lived of all Range Rover generations, being replaced in 2001 by the L322, which actually started development before this car was even seen by the public. So little was the faith that BMW had in this car, even when it was launched, they continued to sell the old classic alongside it for about another two years. And cynics would say that history has proven BMW right, because the P38A, known for the building in which it was developed, very quickly gained a reputation for unreliability. Though this was not exactly new for Range Rover, the fact was the P38 was a car that tried to bring the brand even further up market, with examples well specified costing up to £60,000. And when you're spending that kind of money, you just don't want your car breaking every second Tuesday. I once spoke to somebody who worked at BMW during the period when they owned Rover, and I said to him, what happened? What went so badly wrong? Were Rover really that bad? Were BMW really that bad? And he said, um, very diplomatically, I must say, the issue we had was that BMW customers didn't like clearing oil off their driveway. And that, I think, really does quite neatly summarise the relationship between the two firms. For a long time, all these cars really seemed to have going for them was the fact that they were cheap. I recall a time, about 10 years ago or so, where you could pick one of these up for about 500 quid, and people did. Then they took them green laning, basically destroyed them, and when they were done, chucked them in the bin. As a result, numbers dropped dramatically, and today, partly on account of their rarity, they aren't even cheap anymore, with the very cheapest of Range Rovers actually being this car's successor, the generally much better received L322. So then really, this car's only hope is if you're able to view it as a true classic. And fortunately, there is actually a lot going for it in that department. First off, it really does look like a Range Rover, doesn't it? It's instantly recognisable. Bear in mind, this was only the second of the five generations, but even then, the people at Land Rover knew they had to make the car recognisable. They already had a style icon in the first Range Rover, and they couldn't deviate too far from that template. The design process for the P38 began in around 1988. Originally, there were five different styling concepts for it, four from outside houses and one by Land Rover internally. Two of these made it to the final stage, where they built a full-size example out of clay. One was by Bertoni, the other the internal Land Rover design. I actually managed to find a picture, very rare indeed, from a Land Rover website showing both of them, and uh, I think they made the right choice. Incidentally, the one they chose was the internally designed one. The Bertoni example, to my eyes, looks a little bit too much like a first-generation Renault Espace, not at all a Land or Range Rover. At the time, I'm led to believe this styling wasn't actually all that well received, but today, I think it's fair to say this is a classic looking car. Instantly recognisable, and I think actually, particularly in this green over cream, a very handsome devil indeed. 
Underneath, the car was equally as conservative, being essentially an evolution of the classic rather than something all new. That meant body on frame construction combined with beam axles front and rear and an old school differential and transfer case in the middle. The P38 also has the distinction of being the final Range Rover offered with the option of a manual gearbox, but it's an extremely rare one, the vast majority being specified with this four-speed automatic. In fact, as of this morning, of the 2,500 Range Rovers for sale on Autotrader, just six of them have a manual, and all of them are classics. That gearbox will be connected to a choice of one of three engines. You had two versions of the venerable fuel-injected Rover V8. The 4-litre, which actually was a 3.9, but rebadged to differentiate it from its predecessor, and a 4.6, which is what I'm driving today. These were also joined by a 2.5-litre BMW turbo diesel. However, I would say that is best avoided. Even this, which is the most powerful of all P38s, isn't exactly pokey, delivering 230 horsepower, 280 pound foot of torque that's 380 newton meters but the diesel put out quite a bit less power nearly a hundred horses less and somehow less torque as well just 200 pound foot 0 to 60 in the diesel 17 seconds even here it's not exactly brisk but I'll try for you all retained much of its predecessors rugged fundamentals Land Rover knew this was a car they wanted to take increasingly more up market and so there was a great focus on increased refinement NVH and overall livability they knew as prices went up an increasing number of people would be using these exclusively on the road rather than the green stuff so they wanted to make sure it was as pleasant a car as could be and I have to say largely I think they've done a pretty good job it is fairly impossible to hide the fact it is still a pretty basic thing underneath, but the fact is I'm currently following another Range Rover, and that's not the first time I've done this today. This is proof that what they did worked. The Range Rover has become a global icon. 50 years after its introduction, it's still going strong, and to many, still the top of its class. Helping it achieve those goals were the fact you had standard fitment air ride that this car no longer has because, as with many, at some point it failed and it was decided rather than try and trace the problem just to eliminate the air suspension system entirely. A few years ago this was a fairly common thing to do, but today stuff like that is fairly frowned upon and for myself I would want a car with the original system. As I have yet to drive one so equipped, I can't tell you how comfortable they are or not, but even this one is doing a fairly admirable job. It still has that constant jitter you get with all sort of body on chassis cars but actually it's fairly decent and this plush interior really does help. Gorgeous leather, wood everywhere and yeah sure the switch gear is a little bit comical but this is a car that has quite a few nice things in it. Heated seats, they're broken. Cruise control, that's broken. Air conditioning, that's broken. Heated front screen, heated rear screen and a sunroof, that's not broken. Hmm, I like that. The overall vibe is certainly of a very luxurious thing. I've been in many an S-Class or a 7 Series of the time, and I have to say, in terms of material and overall quality, though this isn't quite a match for the best of them, it's not a bad effort, I have to say. The only other modification of note to this car is the exhaust. It now has a stainless steel item in place of the factory one. It is not particularly raucous, but makes instead a very pleasing burble. This was never an engine that was all about high RPM. Peak power is developed at 4,750, and to get it anywhere close to six really is an effort. In fact, I believe the red line is just shy of that.
This particular car is a 1997 4.6 HSE, HSE being the trim. This is one of the higher trim levels, though not the highest. With the P38, like the classic, Range Rover continued their tradition of building special edition models, varyingly badged things that often featured some nice inlays and stuff like that. Perhaps my favourite being the Holland and Holland. They're quite fantastic things too. They do a modern version as well. If you don't believe me, just uh, Google Range Rover Holland and Holland. They're incredible, borderline artwork inside. Over the years, efforts were certainly made to improve the reliability and reputation of the P38, but I think it's fair to say that it never fully shook it. In 1999, the engine management system was changed, so out went the Luca system, as we have here, and in came one by Bosch. Curiously, when that happened, the power figure for the 4.6 actually went down, from about 230 horsepower to about 220. The 4 litre stayed the same, 190 horses, which in any case just isn't enough for a car that weighs this much. The diesel likewise was unaffected, but over its life did get a little bit more efficient. As a bit of consolation for the reduced power output, the 4.6 did at least become a little bit torquier by another 20 pound foot, and in fairness, that really is what this car needs. Sadly, in Rover tradition, many of the other technological advancements of this car also turned out to be its Achilles heels. So you have down here the HVAC or HEVAC, as they like to call it, system that controls all of your aircon and heating. It looks pretty mundane to a modern viewer, but for the time was quite trick. These do like to fail, though this one here is fully operational. It's not actually the screen itself that goes, but instead some of the cables behind. Likewise, these cars had something called the Body Electronic Control Module, the BECM. One of the issues you see with the old classic was that as it became more advanced, it gained more different pieces of electronics, but none of them liked talking to each other. So for this car, they developed the body electronic control module that helped exactly that happen. So various parts of the car could now communicate. Today, completely normal, but back then, pretty advanced. Unfortunately, again, it didn't always work all that well, meaning you could wind up in a situation where a car was reporting a problem with one system that was actually caused by another. The BECM itself also liked to fail, and in the early days, people just didn't know how to deal with these things, so often they would try and diagnose it by replacing parts at great cost or simply give up. Handily, today, both the HEVAC and the BECM can be fixed because there is now a network of specialists that exist to look after these things. Though that being said, even Land Rover Monthly themselves are keen to point out that these were always expensive cars and will always be expensive to run in just about every way you can imagine. Being older, tax won't be too hideous, but fuel economy is. On a run, you'll get low 20s around town teens, even the diesel isn't that great. And though some of the small stuff, the routine maintenance is considered very simple, easy to DIY if you're that way inclined, there is always something that'll likely need tending to with a car of this vintage, particularly when they were so cheap for quite so long. Corrosion on these is not quite as hideous an issue as it is with some others, but it's still something you do need to watch out for, particularly if owners have modified their cars, like for example the previous owner of this, who fitted light guards to the car, which involved drilling loads of holes in the bodywork, holes that now are open to the elements, and Brad, this car's lovely owner, will be doing something about fairly soon. Incidentally, this was quite an unusual purchase for him. He's had many cars on the channel before, but they've almost exclusively been unusual Japanese vehicles that he often imports himself. Why then did he wind up with this? And by answering that, I'll also be able to tell you whether this is a car that you should think about buying. You see, he'd bought a couple of cars from Japan, but owing to various shipping delays, they hadn't arrived. And he knew that in January, he wanted to head off up to Snowdonia, visit the lakes, do a little bit of touring in some fairly rugged countryside. And he decided he wanted something appropriate to do that journey in. Though he wasn't initially set on a Range Rover, he'd always wanted to own a big 4x4 of some description, and these are the default. So he went online, started looking at what was out there for reasonable money, and saw several Range Rovers. He was taken by the classic looks of the P38 and bought this example essentially blind. And it would appear he's got himself something of a bargain. First off, this colour combination is absolutely stunning. Easily for me, the best you could have on a Range Rover of any generation. Green, cream, wood, nice. 
It's got the best engine, okay sure, an earlier version, but frankly these days I think that's splitting hairs. The previous owner had had it for about six or seven years, clearly had looked after it, although it wasn't cosmetically particularly good. His dog essentially lived in this car and I'm told when Brad got it you could sort of just claw out heaps of fur and mud and things from the back not nice but Brad has done a fabulous job of sprucing the place up and today if he hadn't told me that you just wouldn't know. The gearbox is smooth, operates as it should and though I'm sure it's partly responsible for the car's lethargic performance and um, prodigious thirst it suits it very well. It also has many of the key Range Rover qualities. It's certainly a competent off-roader. If you want to go just about anywhere, this, I'm sure, will take you there. It also has plenty of room inside. You've got a sunroof up front, so it feels nice and light and airy. It has that sense of warmth that only really companies like Jaguar and Land Rover seem to do really well. Even Bentley today have lost that art, but this has it in spades. It's also genuinely more usable than a classic, has something like 50% more boot space, and that I do appreciate. It means this is a car that, so long as you can put up with the running costs, you could certainly use day to day. It's also a pretty pleasant thing to drive, not quite as dynamic as the later L322, and I suppose not quite as iconic to some as the earlier classic, but it's still something you can pick up for relatively good money. Today, a very clean, later, low mile example with 50 to 60,000 on the clock is going to set you back about 10,000 pounds. And for something as iconic as the Range Rover, that's an awful lot of car for not a lot of money. Even if you look at it simply in terms of scrap value, there's a lot of metal here for your moolah. The super low window line, the squared off bonnet also mean this is a very easy car to drive and to place on the road, so at no point today has it felt even remotely daunting. These really are a very, very well thought out package. And I must confess that coming into today, I wasn't really sure what I was going to think of it. But actually, having driven it now, I quite like it. I think it's the, uh, the shaggy old dog of the classifieds. It's impossible to resist the charms of something like this. Anyway. A big thanks to Brad for bringing his car out, and as ever, to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.